Hallelujah. I want to uh, I want to share a message this morning. I'm going to target it basically to two groups of individuals. I, I want to speak individually to those who have a a promise from the Lord, whether it's a promise that you have received prophetically, or somebody perhaps, or several somebodies have spoken something over your life that seems to have borne witness in your heart, and yet there's been a long passage of time, and that prophetic word has not taken place. Maybe it's a, a word the Lord gave you personally in a time of prayer or, or in, in studying God's word, but there was that sense that you had, and yet now with the passage of time, there's this growing frustration, this growing questions personally about the word that the Lord has given you. I'm also going to speak this message in the context of revival. I'm a revivalist, uh, uh, evangelist. Um, I don't, somebody told me the other day, he said, you know, he said, we're still trying to figure out exactly who you are. He said, we're trying to decide, are you a Holy Ghost person or are you a evangelist? It's two wings of the same bird. Okay, you know, it's just there are moments that there's one expression that becomes the lead expression. It's what God's doing in that particular moment. At other times, it's a different expression of what God's doing, but it's the same bird. Just got two different wings on it. And, uh, but, but when the Lord allowed us to begin to become increasingly a part of the fiber of the nation of New Zealand, the first time we came with the intent of ministry, First time we came, we came to attend a conference. Had no intent of ministering. I just came to attend a conference. Often God doesn't tell you everything he has in mind. Because if he did, it would scare the living daylights out of us. And so he just gives you enough information for the next day. And so we just came to attend a conference. And I won't go into all of that story. But we were coming back to minister for six weeks. And on the flight, the Lord spoke to my heart. Now, this is not a part of my message. I'm just going to drop this in before I get started. And he said to me, basically, I felt this impression that there were two things I was to communicate to New Zealand. And uh, he said uh, to me, tell them. Now, I'll be honest. When the Lord told me two things he wanted me to communicate to New Zealand, I said, Lord, I don't do messages for nations. You know, I just, I just need a sermon for the night. You know, I said, Lord, I don't have a platform for the nation, you know. I just, just need a sermon for the group that I'm speaking to. But he just bore this into my heart and said, tell them this. Tell them to own their own revival. Tell New Zealand to own their own revival. And, uh, and there's several implications of that. I'll let you and the Lord sort that out. The second thing he said, and tell them to rend their heart. Because I'm not going to rend the heavens until they rend their hearts. Now, I've discovered over the years, it's not too difficult for us to embrace the first part. Because we, and if you're from Australia, forgive me for what I'm getting ready to say. We don't really want an Aussie revival. <laughs> now, having, having said that, I would hasten on to say we don't want an American one either. That what we want is one that God has designed for Kiwis. So we embrace owning our own to some extent. Rending our hearts a bit more confrontive. It's a bit more challenging. Because that doesn't kind of fit our DNA quite as well. So I, I just leave that with you. So why is it that God's promises for revival... Why is it the promise that God has given to you seems so long in coming? I mean, if the revival for Hamilton is not a God schedule until 2020, why should he start prophesying in 1980 and before? Doesn't he understand some will become cynical? I've met them. Doesn't he understand some will become discouraged? And maybe that's the seat that you sit in. Doesn't he understand that some will question his integrity? 
Doesn't he understand that some will become exhausted? Doesn't he understand that some will come to the point that they will simply give up? Doesn't he understand that Satan will use the season between the promise and the performance to cause people to walk away? I live in the real world. I have been both privileged by God to hold the microphone in some of the most significant moves of God. The number of times I've been in meetings with people who say, we have never in our life seen anything like this, been a part of this, and God let me be there. At the same time, I live with the unanswered questions of the promises that God has spoken to us and sitting with individuals whose hearts have been broken as they have wrestled be it the young pastor who God had spoken to them apparently about what God was getting ready to do in their church, a church that had become the fastest growing church in their state in the U.S. And yet somewhere between that promise and the performance, a church split occurred. Devastated that young preacher. He left there to go to another community and tried to pastor. did not go well. After a couple of years, he came back to the first city and started a church and immediately began to grow. And it reached the three digits in attendance and then suddenly it blew up in his face again. Struggling with the fact that God had said to him, I'm going to send revival, I'm going to send this to your church and living with what seemed to be the apparent reality of his life. He basically disappeared from the scene and I would try to, I would send him messages, no answers. I would call him, no responses. Finally, we were in his state and he finally did respond and I got a hold of him. I said, what are you doing? He said, working. I said, what does that mean? What do you think it means? I said, tomorrow or Tuesday? Which is the better day for my wife and I to come see you and your wife? He said, you don't need to do that. I said, that wasn't the question. I said, I'm coming. Is it Monday or Tuesday? And I sat with him as he began to open up his heart to me. Not only out of ministry, but struggling, hanging on by his fingernails to any type of relationship with the Lord. His wife, if possible, was in a worse state. My wife spent hours with his wife, and I spent time with him, and he finally said to me, please don't tell my wife this. He said, but I drive down the highway composing sermons in my mind. I said, bro, you're not as far away as you want me to think that you are. Broken. Not so much by the situations and what happened with the people, but probably more so because he was dealing with the disillusionment and the disappointment of the things he believed that God had said to him that seemed not to be taking place and there was no evidence they were going to. Or I think of the pastor's wife here in this nation whose husband had lived with a prophetic word of some sort, I don't know the details, but simply that a, a word concerning the ministry that they would have outside the boundaries of this nation died having never left the shores of New Zealand and she was struggling. You see, the real world that I live in includes ministering to those broken individuals who are trying to, to balance what they believe God has said and what appears to be taking place the denominational leader in one of the streams of this nation who my wife and I sat with probably 15 years ago now. And brokenly, really, he said to me, I have been listening for 35 years to the promises of national revival coming to this nation. When? He's a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and struggling. And often there are things we go through and we deal with and we're almost afraid to express them lest somebody think less of us for the reality of being this is what we're emotionally dealing with. 
So I said, Lord, I need, I need some help. Not only personally in walking through my own life situation, but the individuals that we minister to. Lord, there were people that, that had been broken by, by what appears to them to be failure. They love you, but they're struggling. I want you to consider with me. These are the things I believe the Lord dropped into my heart. Maybe they will help you. I'm going to share four principles with you and then a series of questions. If God told us, and this is what he said to me, different time frame, but he said, if the revival that I was going to send, if I were to say it's going to come, and we'll say Hamilton, New Zealand, in March 2020, how many do you know that would not pray, would not prepare, would not repent until after January of 2020, after their holiday? We were a church in the city of Indianapolis, Indiana. It was a church that had a reputation for being in revival. Wherever I would travel in that state, I would ask pastors, name me three churches that are experiencing an unusual move of God. I probably got 12, 15 churches on the list, but this church was on every single person's list. And finally, the pastor contacted me and said, would you come and spend a few days with us? God turned up in a church where God had already turned up and what was scheduled for a few days ultimately ran for a number of weeks, number of people coming into the kingdom of God. But the pastor came to us after that first Sunday and he said to my wife and I, he said, why is it that the extended meetings you have been preaching if so many people are getting saved, why is it those meetings come to a close? My wife said, because people get exhausted. He said, that won't happen to us. <laughs> Five days later, he said, I've never been so tired in my life. <laughs> but God began to deal with him, and he came to me pretty shook somewhere during that first week. And he said to me, he said, I believe that God spoke to me and said that after the fourth week, that which we have longed for is going to take place. I said, wow. He said, obviously, I want you to cancel everything you're doing between now and then. And you're not going anywhere. You're just staying here. And then he said, do you think we should tell the people what God said? I said, you're the pastor. But let me ask you a question. The word that the Lord gave you, was it a conditional promise or an unconditional promise? How many understand God operates on both systems? There are some promises that are unconditional in the fullness of time. God would send his son. It didn't make any difference what hell did. It didn't make any difference what mankind was going to do. That there was an unconditional promise, a time frame that God had set in his own mind that I am going to send my son. And salvation's plan will begin to be put into effect. But there are other promises that are very conditional. One of the most well-known of those is that promise for revival. If my people, which are called by my name, then. Until the if has been met, there is no then. Conditional. So I said to the pastor, the promise God gave you, was it conditional or unconditional? Because if it was conditional... And it depends upon the response of the people to the next few weeks. I said, your people may not be like other people. But I do know my share of individuals, if we were to say to them that God has said that on the fifth Sunday after the fourth week, the revival that you have longed for is going to break upon the scene, they would stay home for the next four weeks. No particular reason to show up yet because Jesus has already said he's not coming to the fifth week. I said, so if it's unconditional, it won't matter. I said, but if it's conditional, it may very well be that the promise that God would give to you becomes the very thing that keeps the promise from being fulfilled. You see, often I want God to give me the exact time frame. 
But he were to say, if I were to do that, you probably wouldn't meet the conditions. And therefore, my giving you the revelation of my intention would become the very thing that would keep that from taking place. There is a work that God is trying to do in us in preparation for the fulfillment of the things he has promised us. Whether it's the work of perseverance, don't you love that word? So, oh God, give me patience and give it to me right now. <laughs> men in my church in a men's prayer gathering said, I want you men to pray for me that God will give me patience. I said, are you sure? I said, scripture says tribulation worketh patience. I said, do you really want me to pray? He said, yeah. So we did. A week later, I said, how's it going? He said, the tribulation has come. I said, I'll keep praying. Faith, hope, discipline that God has to work into our lives so that we have the capacity to carry the promise. Second principle comes right off of that. Perhaps God uses the delays to prepare us to handle the promise. I was preaching actually here in New Zealand. Only time this has ever happened to me, I'm kind of waiting for it to happen again woke up this particular morning and immediately I heard the Holy Spirit speak to my heart and he said this to me what do you want me to do tonight I had never had him ask me that in a meeting you know what do you want me to do tonight I said well now that you mention it I said how about city-wide revival breaking out in this city tonight. Do you think they're ready? That was his response to me. Now, how many understand when God asks you a question, he is not looking for information? You understand that? It's not like God's going, I, I don't know. Let's ask life in good. <laughs> I knew that when God asked me that question, do you think they're ready? The answer was already in the question. There was no condemnation, but it was the awareness the Spirit was saying to me, do you think they're ready at this point in time to handle that? You know, sometimes we preachers really do crazy things like, oh God, send us another Pentecost. 3,000 people got saved on that day. That's awesome. The average church, that would kill the pastor. You know, I mean, what do you do with 3,000 new babies? I mean, they at least had 120 people to start with in the upper room. You know, so they had a decent sized staff to begin with. But, oh God, we need you to send us a Pentecost. He says, how about I start with something a little bit smaller than that? That's, I was preaching a meeting where they had the list of, if I counted them right, like 10,000 names on the back wall of their auditorium. I counted them. I stood back there and counted them. Pieces of paper with names of unsaved loved ones and family members and friends and enemies and all of that. And so I'm praying for that. And God moved. And we're, a one-week meeting became a two-week meeting. And 47 people had responded at that point to a salvation altar call. Nearly 30 of them had never one time in their life asked Jesus Christ to come in. Absolute first-time conversions. I mean, I would say things like this to them now. I want you to be in the meeting tomorrow night. And, and then I want you to be here Sunday. And then I want you to get baptized in water. And they went to the pastor and said, okay, we can figure out, come tomorrow night. And we can put together, show up Sunday. What is this baptism in water stuff? I mean, they didn't have a clue. And the pastor said to me at the end of the second week, can you stay another week? Now, I knew it was only going to be one more week, and there's a, a number of things fitting in. But I felt like the Spirit of God said to me, who does he have to help him? 
Now, it was a church that actually had the size to be able to manage what was taking place. Uh, but there were many of the dear saints who had no interest in managing what was taking place. Uh, they wanted to enjoy it. And, Pastor, you do the work and we'll stand on the sideline and we'll cheer. And I said, bro, I love you. No. Because you're going to have your hands full dealing with 47 babies and send them mature and develop and grow in the Lord so that they're not lost to the kingdom of God. So there are moments that, that God may say things. It's not that God is, is against us. He simply knows that he knows what our potential is, but we're not there yet. And so the promise is given, but he is aware that from the promise to the performance, there has to be some things that, that take place inside of us to be able to carry the things he wants us to carry. God uses the delays. Now this may mean that some will never see their dream fulfilled here. Especially the corporate dream. They're a part of a larger corporate dream. Hebrews chapter 11 is God's response. For you read in Hebrews chapter 11 of men like Abraham who believed God for a city. And he lived in a tent. And the reality is as long as Abraham was on planet earth, he lived in a tent. He was believing for a city with foundations. But on this side of the great divide, he never lived in the city with foundations. He lived in a tent. But God honored his faith. Abraham has his city. You see, what God had in mind was even bigger than Abraham had in mind. But even before the city, he had already gained God's favor. You see, we sometimes think that we only have gained God's favor when we have seen the end product of what we're believing for. God takes as much pleasure in your willingness to walk the journey as he does in seeing the completion of that journey take place. Olympians do not win the gold with six weeks of training. One Olympian gold medal winner was asked, how, how was it that you have been so successful? He said, I simply stayed in the gym five minutes longer than anybody else. In five minutes, six days a week, over the course of a number of years, man, he has spent a lot of additional time preparing for that which was his goal in his life. So sometimes God is at work in the system and the delays to prepare us so we can actually handle that which he's going to give to us. It's not that he's saying I'm not going to do it, but he literally says right now, if I were to do what some of you want me to do right now, it, you absolutely could not handle it. Can you imagine if our shadow started healing the sick? I mean, in one sense, that'd be awesome. Another sense, some of us would not know what to do with ourselves. We'd have to start a new ministry. We'd call it Shadow Healers International. <laughs> we'd print a business card. And then we'd have discussions about, you know, does the healing on the shadow, does it work best under the natural light of the sun, or does it work as effectively under the indoor lights and we get so impressed don't you know who I am I, I'm the shadow healer if the day can come that we're not particularly overwhelmed or impressed with ourselves you know young preachers are interesting I, I was one once you get, you get credentials, and the first thing you want to do is you put REV in, in front of everything. <laughs> You're reverent. 
I remember my wife and I, we were, we were going to get our, our, our wedding, uh, so our, our marriage certificate application for marriage, whatever it was we were doing. So we're standing, <laughs> they're getting our marriage license applied for, and, and, the, and I signed reverent because I had just gotten my credentials. And the lady said, you're a preacher. I said, yes, ma'am. I was 21, looked like I was 17. And, and, and she said, don't you ever get sick of people? Which kind of told me where she was at. And I said something to this effect. How can you get sick of people? God loves them. They're, they're his plan. And of course, I had never pastored a church. You know, I, I hadn't done anything. I had just been given my credentials while I was in Bible college. And I was just brand new and fresh. But we can become really impressed. And God says, but I'm going to have to take you through some stuff to season you. So that when I begin to do those sort of things through your life and ministry, you don't get this overinflated opinion of yourself. You know, that you do recognize it really isn't about you. It really is about Him. And you begin to understand it's not, it's not that there is something uniquely special in us, but there is something incredibly uniquely special in Him. And if we can come to the place that he can trust us. It's one of my ongoing. God, I want to be trustworthy. I want to be the type of person in you that the promises that you have given, which is your desire for my life, that I will be actually able to carry that because you can trust me to do that. Revival. This is my third principle. Revival will always come. The promise that God has given to you will always be fulfilled at the junction of our obedience and God's glory. I must obey. Timing relates to his understanding of larger kingdom principles. Whether it's in my personal life or whether it's in the life of the church or, or the promises of God for a nation, there's this complicated interaction of our different lives. What is good for one may not necessarily be good for somebody else. Let me illustrate it with a dumb illustration, but you'll get the point. It's the little boy who he's been brought up in a home that believes God and believes the word and you pray and you speak to your mountains and, and God moves and it's thoroughly inside of him because he's been taught this and he believes it and he wants to go swimming. So he goes down to the local swimming pool and, but the dark clouds gather in and the lightning begins to flash, and the thunder begins to sound, and so they announce, uh, we're going to close the pool, but this is, a, this is a young man full of faith in the promise of God, and the word is so he's standing outside that pool, and he's pointing his finger at that dark cloud, and in the name of Jesus, I command you rain to stop. In the name of Jesus, I command the thunder to quit. Lightning, you will go away. Meanwhile, a kilometer up the road, there's a farmer. <laughs> who's been praying for the rain to come and feed his parched crops. And he's out there thanking Jesus. Thank you, Father, that the rain has come. Listen, one of those two is about to be disappointed. Which does not mean that God wasn't concerned about both of them. But it means there are moments in our lives that we do not understand the things that are taking place behind the scenes. And so we say, God, you have to do it this way at this time. And God would say, but you don't understand that there are things taking place. If I do it that way at this time, it's going to create a mess over here. But if you will trust me, I'm going to work in this situation in such a way that I'm going to meet what it is I promised you. And I'm going to take care of what it is I promised them as well. My, uh, one, of my, one of my granddaughters, they, they were living in the 
western part of Texas. Now, West Texas is dry in a good year. <laughs> it's like, now why do you want to live in West Texas? You know, the cactus above the ground and rattlesnakes. You know, and of course under the ground they've got oil, which explains why people go there. But they had been in drought and, and, and she was attending a Christian school and they had been praying for months for God to send the rain. And it began to rain. And these kids in this school, they were so excited. They never thought about how long it would take. And she was so pumped that she, she wanted to tell grandma and grandpa, we were praying for God to send rain and it rained today. And there were moments as we passionately pursue the promise of God for revival, there are moments as you passionately hold on to the promise that God has given to you for the members' salvation of members of your family or for a particular healing or for a particular promise that we have to trust God in working out the timings. Principle number four. In a relay team, all run. Only one breaks the ribbon. And God identifies us as his family. Now I know that he relates to us individually. I understand that I'm in a personal relationship with him. But I also understand he puts me in a spiritual family. We are members of the body of Christ. And that there are moments that, and I'm fascinated with the way that God gives honors and rewards. David wants to build a, a house for God. And God says, I'm not going to let you build the house of God. Your son is going to build it. And so David begins the process of putting things together so that his son can build it. Now it's called Solomon's temple. But if you examine the scripture, David also gets honored for it. And in God's economy, God rewards David for what Solomon does. Because God sees him as a part of the same team. They're flowing together. If you're on a relay team, whether you're in the swimming pool or whether you're one of those running around a track, I use the track because I'm more familiar with that. Most people don't know the names of the second runner. And nobody knows the name of the third runner. Sometimes we know the names of the first guy, but usually the one we really know, the last one. The guy that broke the tape. I want to be the last runner. I want to be running with the baton when that revival that God has said is coming to the nation begins to break forth. When the clouds of the rain of revival that are hanging low over the nation begin to release that which God has said he intends to do. I want to be the guy holding the baton. I want to be running that lap. Amen. But I don't have that promise. No, I've got some incredibly wonderful promises that God has given me personally. Incredibly wonderful promises. Things just that I'm going to see. Some of it, in fact, I asked God once, why is it, God, that every time you give me a promise for an even larger harvest, the size of the crowds I speak to gets smaller? You know, I still don't have an answer for that one, but it's... But I've learned this. If the guy running the second lap doesn't run, it doesn't make any difference what that last guy does. If that third person holding the bat and says, you know what, I don't get across the finish line. I'm not going to run. I think I'll just kind of stroll my way around this course and maybe I'll stop and do some other things for a while because, hey, I don't get to break the tape. Anyway, nobody knows who I am. I'm not important. If runners two and three don't do their job, runner four never gets the opportunity to do his. It's the lady that said to me, I have been interceding for 35 years 
for God to send revival, and God did in her city. And they had this incredible season, but then rejection came. It's a weird story. I know the, I know the people involved. They literally had a, a, a meeting to vote the evangelist out of the revival. Weird. And then they voted the pastor out of the church. That didn't surprise me. Once you vote the revival to be over, I figure the next thing's coming. And this lady was just broken. She said, I don't have 35 more years to pray. No, I didn't think God probably was going to take another 35 years, but the issue, sis, isn't do you get to pray till it happens again? You just have an assignment. And sometimes our prayer does not get totally answered until we go to the other side. And we're still carrying our petition before the throne. And we're saying, Father, you remember. You remember what you promised me about my family? Hasn't happened yet, Father, but Lord, here I am at your throne now. Father, you remember what you said to me about my nation? Hasn't happened yet, but so Lord, here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm closer now than I was on earth. Now I can be right here where I can talk to you, Lord, and say, remember what you said. So here's the questions I have for you. Will you sacrifice your kingdom in order to build his kingdom? If I was speaking to a group of pastors today, that would be an incredibly significant question. God gave me a word to a church one time and said to me, would you ask them if they're willing to be the intercessors for the city, even if the revival that I send to the city starts somewhere else? Uh, Lord, can you have somebody else ask them that? <laughs> that's, that's not a promise they want to hear. To experience an ongoing outpouring you see, I, my wife and I walked into a church in Indiana uh, be nine years ago this August. What was scheduled for three days has become the greatest move of the Spirit of God, the greatest habitation, and a church known for great moves of God. But they're living now in the greatest move they have ever experienced, an entire generation growing up who knows nothing except revival. Churches in the whole region being affected by what it is that God is doing there. But there came a point that God began to ask me some questions. Are you willing to let go of your kingdom so that I can build mine? Will you let go of your outpouring so I can do my outpouring? I said to the pastor, I said, you know, I said, I'm not going to prophesy this, but here's what I think is about to happen. I said, God's going to start bringing in other voices. And I said, I, I primarily... I, I primarily can carry an evangelist anointing or a revivalist, but fivefold to be an evangelist or sometimes a bit of a prophet's edge. But I said, but I said, God's going to bring in other voices. And I said, as he does that, I said, I suspect my voice will begin to diminish. As a fact, the day may come that we will have so diminished that People will wake up, look around, and say, hey, whatever happened to that couple? What, what, what was their name? You know, they used to be here, uh, Linda, and what was his name? <laughs> now, they laughed at that, but that's exactly what's happened. God began to bring in prophets. I mean, like the real deal prophets. Now, before that, I would prophesy. But after God brought the prophets, he said, hey, I don't need you to do that. I got the 18 now. You're the B team, I can use you, but I got the A team. And then God began to bring in apostolic type voices. And the pastor of the church would say, this was Michael's revival. And because he was willing to take a step back and be more concerned for the kingdom than his own reputation, he said, God has taken this to places none of us would have experienced. Was that always easy? No. There were people that said to my mother, are they, trying to get, are they trying to push Michael out of the revival? No, we're just trying to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. 
So the question God had asked me personally, are you willing to sacrifice your kingdom to build my kingdom? My willingness to do so would have an impact upon the depth of that meeting. My willingness to do so would have an impact on a generation of younger preachers. My willingness to do so will impact how much God will be able to do in and through me. It may be that God will ask you, are you willing to set aside what you think is the fulfillment to let me actually fulfill it in my way? Question two, will you run without growing weary? Will you walk without fainting? Will you stay the course until he comes? Often God sends one to sow and another to reap. Can you be happy with that? Question three, in a city, will you partner with someone else even if they get the honor and you get forgotten? Will you commit to developing relationships of honor in the kingdom of God simply because it's right? Will you pray for God to bless somebody else even at the apparent of expense of God blessing you? You see, God's looking for my attitudes, my character. The depth of what he's going to be able to build depends upon the depth of the character he can produce within us. If all you're wanting to build is a little three-sided lean-to, you don't need any foundation. But if you want to build a 30-story building that's going to be standing 200 years from now, you better dig deep. There better be a foundation under that thing. And God often takes much longer than we want Him to take to build the foundation inside of us to be able to carry the promise He's given us. Linda, would you come to the keyboard? been speaking all weekend on the keys to revival and I said Lord I'm, I know this is what I think I'm supposed to do but are you sure? In fact I even said Lord how in the world do I do an altar on this? And there's only really three things that I want to do. I think this is the Lord. I am going to give that invitation for those in this room that you are not yet in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I know that you're interested because if you weren't, you wouldn't be here. You know, I had a guy one time in a, I was preaching a meeting that became a month-long revival and for whatever reason, I had stepped out of the auditorium into the foyer area to check something on, a, I think it was a sign up for fasting and prayer. And the auditorium doors suddenly flew wide open and this young man came racing past me. So I did what seemed to me to be perfectly logical at the moment. I tackled him. It just seemed like the right thing to do at the moment. So I tackled the guy and, and I said, where are you going? He said, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I'm an atheist. I said, no, you're not. Oh, yes, I am. No, 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 you're not an atheist. I said, if you were an atheist, you wouldn't be here. You may be an agnostic. You may have a lot of questions. You may have more questions and answers. But there's something inside of you that said there's a possibility. And he broke and began to say, I'm a backslidden seminarian. I said, yeah, that's why you're here. Because there's a call from heaven coming to you. So I don't know why you think you're here, but you're here because God said, I want you to, on this journey, I'm going to draw you closer to me. And for some of you, he's saying it's time to open the door 
and step on inside the kingdom. And in a moment, I want to give you a chance to do that. Secondly, there are some of us in this room and we have been struggling with a promise. And the struggle has caused us to go anywhere from thinking what's wrong with us and Satan has banged you on the head. Or at some level, the questions, the struggles have caused you to say what's wrong with God. And you would almost never want to let those words slip out of your mouth, but that's exactly what you're feeling. You'll feel a bit like the lady who occasionally will contact our office when she's suicidal. She told me one day, I don't think you and Jesus are going to let me kill myself. I said, not on my watch if I can help it. But one of the reasons she's been where she's at is because she's so disappointed. Because there were things that she believed that God promised to her and it didn't happen. She said, I believe, didn't God say he'd meet all of my needs? So why did I lose my home? Now, there are some moments, there's things that you know that you really can't say yet. Like I was tempted to say, well, ma'am, you know, the job that God gave you to provide income so you could pay your bill, the job that you decided you didn't like so you quit, maybe it's not that God didn't provide. Maybe it's you failed to walk in the provision that he gave you. But I knew at that moment I probably shouldn't say that. I would say that for another time of counseling with her. I just put my arms around her and weep with her for a few moments. But some of us, it may be that we're carrying disappointment and disillusionment with ourselves and sometimes with God. And today he's going to invite you to run to him. And he may not give you the answer. It's fascinating. Bear with me just a minute. You read the book of Job. And essentially, Job was one of the few people in the book that doesn't have a clue. We read the book and we understand exactly from the beginning to the end what's taking place. We understand there had been a discussion in heaven between God and Satan. And that Job has become, in some sense, a test case. And that God has said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? What? And Satan said, yeah, well, if you do this, he won't serve you. And Job goes to the greatest challenge of his life, not understanding why. He doesn't understand before it happens. He doesn't understand when it's happening. And when you read God's response to Job in chapters 38 to 40, God never bothers to explain to Job why. He never says, now listen, Job, you didn't know this, but the devil and I are having this conversation, and I needed to let the devil know that I believed in you. Job never gets that. All he has at the end of the day is this conviction. I know my Redeemer lives. He is, he is sure in his own heart. I have not violated God. I have not broken his word. He is struggling because he never does get the answer. He doesn't realize what's happened until he dies. As far as we can tell, he never, God never explains to him and God did that on purpose. Because some of us are going to walk through some moments. And the same God that would give Job the strength to come through is going to give you the strength to come through. And sometimes he may tell you why. And sometimes he may never explain to you. He'll just say, can you trust me? Can you trust me? Some of us are in that moment today where we need to say to him, God, to the best I know how, I trust you. My youngest brother was killed in a military accident. Helicopter blew up in midair. 
When the phone call reached me, I said to the Lord, Father, I know what it is for you to wake me up to pray for people. I know what it is for you to drop into my heart the names of preachers and to pray for them and to ring them on the phone and that moment be the catalyst, a turnaround point in their life. I, I know that. I, why didn't you wake me up? I thought I could pray. The only thing he would say was trust me. And I had to come to that point of saying, Lord, I will, I will preach that you are good. I will preach that you are faithful. Not because of the circumstances that I'm currently walking in, but because you are who you said you are. In a moment, some of us are going to come and say, God, I don't understand. I believe you gave me a promise. I'm not seeing any sign of it taking place, but I want you to know. I trust you and I'm going to live in light of the city that has a foundation that you promised me. Some of you are bearing a particular burden for your nation. This has not been an easy 10 days for New Zealand. This has been days that most of us in this room never dreamed could possibly happen in this nation. And you're trying to connect how can this happen and how does this relate to the promises of God? And you're carrying a burden. And you may say, but God, it seems like we're farther away now than we've ever been. Would you stand with me? I don't want this message to be received negatively. It's really not unbelief. I've been gut level honest with you. Because what I have shared is where many of you live. It's where I've walked. Would you bow your heads for just a moment? Those in this auditorium that you have not yet made a commitment of your life to Jesus, you've never known him, you once knew him and you've walked away, you're doing things Jesus would not do, and you're at a point that you would say, on my journey I'm ready to open the door and step inside. And I'd like to ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins and come into my life and be my Savior today. Before I do anything else, I want to pray for you. If I'm describing you wherever you're standing, would you do this? Would you put your hand in the air where I can see it? Just slip your hand up where I can see it. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I want to pray for you. I'm just going to wait a few seconds. Say, so Michael, that's me. I'm, I'm on, on my journey. I've not gotten into the kingdom yet, but I think I'm ready. Those of you that couldn't make that decision yet, my prayer for you is that you will not stop short of, the, of God's plan. Others in this room, you say, Michael, this has been like a word from God for me. If for nobody else, God has spoken to my heart today and I just need to respond to him whether it's a personal thing that's in your life or whether it's the corporate revival but you have found yourself saying God why 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 so long and for the next few moments we're going to say Lord I give it to you again I trust you I don't have the answer but I trust you. And would you just open your heart? Linda's going to sing. I was going to bring us forward, but I think I'm not going to do that. I think right where you're standing can be a sacred piece of property. And I want you to be very candid with the Lord.
the prophets of the scripture were often very candid with the Lord. What I discovered in those is God never had a problem with them being very honest with him. He did have a problem when they challenged his integrity. And I've learned that I don't challenge God's integrity. I do have questions. And there are moments I have to bring those questions and then release them to him. Holy Spirit, these are your people. Holy Spirit, these are my brothers and my sisters. Jesus is our elder brother. We're family. We have a father. But Holy Spirit, some of us today are hurting. Some of us are living with personal promises that have never been fulfilled. The ache is on the inside. And some of us in this room are hanging on to our faith by our fingernails. We don't want to miss heaven. We don't want to miss you. But some of us are struggling. And Father, I don't know that you are going to give us the intellectual answer for the delays, for the promises that never seem to take place. I know, Lord, that you're not a man that you would lie, neither the son of man that you would repent. But what I'm going to ask that you would do, Father, is you would come. And in the same way, Father, you took me in your arms when my youngest brother died. And though the circumstances had not changed, you changed me. Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you will come and minister now to brothers and sisters across this room. Even at this moment that they will feel you come and put your arms around them. Even at this moment that you will speak your peace. There may be some, Lord, that you're going to begin to give to them clarity of understanding. Maybe even the principles that I shared today will be helpful, but there are some that will walk out of these doors and the situation will not change this week. But Father, I am praying for the work of the Holy Spirit. Developing the character to actually carry the promise when it comes. Would you minister to my brothers? Would you minister to my sisters across this room right now? Now, would you take a moment? We've already shared with the Lord. I've shared kind of on your behalf. Can you take a moment now to love on Him? It seems contrary to the way we should do things. But there's something that begins to happen in those moments that I don't understand. In the moments of disappointment and disillusionment. Somebody asked Jonathan Wesley once, why is that cow looking over the fence? Or rather, Wesley asked somebody else, why is the cow looking over the fence? He said, I don't know why. He said, because he can't see through it. Some of us are trying to see through our problem. Some of us are trying to see through the promise that hasn't happened. When the Lord has said, would you look above it? Look above it. Look to me. You're on lap two, but you're going to win. Somebody else may finish the race, but your part's vital. Linda, I want you to sing if you would. And I want you to take a moment, church, before I surrender the microphone. Can you take just a moment to lift your hearts before the Lord just in loving Him? If you want to sing with Linda, you can sing. If you just want to, if you want to speak in tongues, speak in tongues. If you just want to quietly be to say, Jesus, I don't understand, but I love you. 
and I trust you. I want you to take a moment and do that. Best place to run. Secure in your love. You're the only one that says. Don't run from him, run to him. Leave me astounded. Leave me amazed. Show off your glory. Let heaven I want you to do one more thing. I want you to put your arm around somebody next to you or put your hand on their shoulder or hand on their elbow or take their hand in your hand. I don't want a chain. I don't want that. <coughs> but two or three. And what I want you to do is put your arm around them and bless them. I want you to put your arm around them and release the strength that God is giving you into their life right now. There's something about that I don't even understand it totally. There's something about I can bless somebody else. The Lord told me to say to that couple, that you believe in them. I said, Lord, I'll do it after the service. He said, do it now. I walked over to this missionary couple, put my arms around them, said, I believe in you. And they broke. Going through the most difficult moment in their life. And in that little statement, it turned it around. There's power as you begin to bless that person next to you. There have been moments I said, Lord, I don't understand this, but I release to this person the strength that you've given to me. For there are areas that I am strong in and there are areas I struggle with. But I want you now to take the strength that God has given to you and you release it to them. And you just bless them with that strength from the Lord. The psalmist said, In the day that I cried unto thee, thou answerest me and strengthenest me with strength in my soul. In the day that I cried unto thee, thou answerest and you strengthened me. I strengthened my brother. I strengthened my sister. Put my arm around them and I strengthen them that they will be strong in the Lord. In the power of His might. And that somehow as I put my arm around them and put my hand on their shoulder that they will know I'm not in this alone. We're running this race together. We're on the same team. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. 
Sheba Babata Kando Now why don't you lift your voice loud enough that the devil can hear it with a shout of triumph and victory. Hallelujah. Shanda Baba Korinda Baba Baba Sike. Blessed be the Lord our God. Blessed be his name. He lives forever and ever and ever. He rules and he reigns. And I rule and I reign with him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph. We shout unto God with the voice of praise. Oh. Satan, you may think you have us surrounded, but we've got news. You have been surrounded. <laughs> Greater is He that's within us than he that's in the world. Greater are the forces with us than the forces against us. So we lift our voices with a shout of victory and triumph. Our God reigns. <laughs>